Good evening. First, I'd like to give thanks to the Lord for the honor and the blessing to be with you. I'd like to give thanks to Father for allowing me to be here in this church and uh, to everyone that has made it possible for me to come here. And I'm going to ask the Lord for his words so that we can share this moment in the spirit of the words. And I'm reading to you from 1 Corinthians 2, 12. And it says, we are the fragrance of Christ. So I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, and the Lord opened doors for me. However, I could not be at peace because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I took leave of them and went to Macedonia. Thanks be to God who always leads us in the triumphant following of Christ and through us spreads the knowledge of him everywhere like an aroma. We are Christ's fragrance rising up to God and perceived by those who are saved as well as by those who are lost. To the latter, it smells of death and leads them to death. To others, it is the fragrance of life and leads to life. But who is worthy of such a mission? Unlike so many who make money out of the word of God, we speak with sincerity. Everything comes from God and it's said in his presence in Christ. The word of the Lord. So I'm here to share this moment of reflection with you, and I beg the Holy Spirit to enlighten me, because I have never prepared what I'm going to say, but I'm sure the Lord has a lot to say. And we are here experiencing our faith, and every time we take communion, mysteriously so, we change. We don't know how much, but we do. And we know that deep inside, that there is a big mystery, that we are part of, we cannot explain it, but we are part of something very large. And it is Christ himself. We are consuming him. We are eating him. We are um, witnessing what we see in the Old Testament when prophets were given like a role to eat. And they were given an infused knowledge of whatever the Lord was going to send to his people through them. And they will appear in those visions where an angel will come and get them to eat something that was completely absurd, like a big book or something. And uh, all of these mysteries are also placed in the Eucharist. God gives us to eat this tasteless bread. We don't see anything supernatural in it, but it is supernatural in essence because Jesus is alive in that bread. So... It's the same thing. Now we are the prophets, we are the priests, we are the ones that each one of us is called to live this mystery, that we have to live in faith. And the mystery is that we acknowledge deep inside ourselves that God is alive in us and that we consume God in the person of Christ. We have no explanation for this in a rational fashion. There is no words, there are no words to explain it. No one can explain this mystery of transubstantiation or the mystery of us eating him. Uh, the, as a matter of fact, most people run away when he said it the first time. They thought he was insane. And a lot of people today still don't know they are actually consuming Christ. That's why they treat the Eucharist the way they treat it. But um, uh, one day, uh, everybody will know what they were consuming. For some, it will be too late because it will be the time when they have to suffer a lot and understand how much they could have done if they would have known really what they were t touching, what they were eating, consuming, what the meaning of the Eucharist really was and the purpose of it and, and, the, and what the essence of it was uh, and what was it supposed to do. And obviously God is not going to charge us for things we don't know. God is going to call, up upon, call us upon what he gives us and what we know. Because as you know, for us to commit a mortal sin, we need three conditions. So even that is ruled by God. So some people are innocent, some people are not, and we have to be responsible for how much we know. 
and this is what we are about. We have to be responsible and conscious about the, what God has entrusted us with. And today, there has never been a louder cry of heaven to us Catholics for us to understand the mystery of the Eucharist. Because this world is a starving of love, a starving of God. And people are so far away from God and every day more and more so because of this materialism and all this indifference to God. And, and we need more than ever to really be conscious as to what it means, what, what it does and, and what is it for. All these mysteries of our faith and how do we deal with them. It's very easy to become a simple Catholic that comes and takes communion and feels good because you come to daily Mass and then feel good because you kneel and pray 20 rosaries and feel good because you go on great pilgrimage and feel good because you read a lot of mystical books and you get into a mystical prayer group and then feel good because you know so much about God, feel so much about God and have so many experiences with God on your own. But that doesn't mean anything. That will not take you to heaven. That will not save your soul. That will not do anything. Because if you are not living the faith so that many can live it through you, then you are worthless. Because what good does it do if you just fill yourself with all this religious experience and then nobody, no one is being touched? No one. No one is being affected by what you do with your religion. So you are as good as the Pharisees. Because that's what the Pharisees were doing. They were so religious. But no one was being touched by their example. No one was being touched by the testimony. There was nothing changing. As a matter of fact, there was a lot of people getting lost and confused because they were a scandal to everyone. So today, God is pushing us to understand the urgency for us to be real, for us to understand our duties, our missions, and for us to deepen ourselves and go deeper, deeper into the mysteries of the faith. There's a lot of preaching, beautiful preaching. There's a lot of extraordinary events in the church. Magnificent things happen when people pray. A lot of things are big, but there's very little changes of the hearts. There's very little teachings where people have to know what they have to do. See, most people are looking for benefits, and religion turned to be like a commodity. It's something that you benefit from. And you're looking for the healer, you're looking for the deliverance, you're looking for benefits for yourself. But no one is looking to change everybody's heart, to bring conversion to the world, to bring peace and God to everyone. See, this becomes like a philosophy almost. The theology is gone. And then we, we have to understand that the responsibilities fall upon each one of us. We are responsible to be real. It's not about me worrying who's real. It's about me worrying if I am real, because this is what God is going to ask me. The day I die, I'm not going to go there with the people I was watching and judging. None of them are going to be with me on my own private trial, personal trial. I'm going to be alone. The Lord is not going to ask me for Tom or for Lucy. He's going to ask me for myself. He says, what happened to you? I gave you responsibilities. What did you do? Show me. And when we go before God, every time we go before God to complain about someone, God will only tell us, show me your niece. That's the only thing he's going to tell you. He's not going to say, yeah, she's terrible. He's horrible. Oh, I know how hurt you are. Never. He's going to say, show me your niece. So you couldn't possibly complain to God about anyone. Never. We, we have to complain about how little we have done. That's what we have to tell the Lord. How little we have done. And this is the beginning of understanding responsibilities our responsibilities in the faith. So it's like uh, I am here, yes, and God gave me the, the gift. Today is just a simple day of the week. And usually people come to Sunday Masses. That's what the regular Catholic is. Now we have been given this gift of coming during the week to Mass and enjoying being here and, and using these incredible gifts that God has passed along to us through Jesus Christ and the traditions of the Church. And then I say, if you understand so much of the faith and you get to the point where you are more than a Sunday Mass Catholic, then that means that God is giving you a lot more and you're understanding a lot more than the Sunday Mass Catholic. And then if you take in that share of the banquet, then you also have to produce that dimension of the banquet that you are receiving. 
because a lot of people are taking a little share of the banquet, some because they don't want more, and some because they don't know that there is more. So depending on who you are. But if you are coming to the banquet so often, because you know the banquet is permanently served, that means that you are to respond for how much feeding you have gotten, because you have to produce according to what you have been given. And so it's not just as simple as receiving. We have to produce, we have to bear fruit with what we have been given. It's not about getting big from everything we are receiving. It's about being ready to distribute and to share everything we are given by God. And what happens is that our religion today is very weak. Um, and it's weak because people are not really uh, understanding our militant church. Our church is a militant one. It's a, it's a church of uh, urgency. It's a church with running against time. It's a church on the run. A, ch a church that ran to the desert. You can see that in, in uh, chapter 12 of the book of Revelation, the church is running. It's out in the desert and it's a pilgrim church. It's always it's, it's on the go, on the go. And bringing souls urgently into this ship of God, bringing them in in this incredible um, navigation towards the, the safe port of God. And it is a battle, constant battle. And there is no time to waste. We all have to do our job really fast before it's over. Because this life is an instant in eternity. And then the next thing you know is over. And then you have to come to your accounts. You have to come before the Lord and present your case. And so today we could ask ourselves, if I come before the Lord today, what will be my situation? How am I doing? It's important to understand that because we, you, you have to know that God will call us anytime. And, and we have, if we are real Catholics and we really understand the gift of the faith, then the biggest teaching of Christ was be ready all the time. Don't wait for tomorrow. Be ready today. And you have to be ready and real. Because being ready is not sufficient. It's being ready and real. Because a lot of people are ready, but they are not prepared. So it's about being ready and real. So a lot of people say, I think I, I'm ready to see the Lord. It's like a lot of people that are caught up with the end times. And, and they, they, they say, when is God coming? When is Jesus returning? Why doesn't he take care of this already? I, w I wish the Lord would come and change all of this right away and take care of this. And I always say, you know, if I will have a request to God about what I want today, I want time so that many souls can be saved. Because what if he comes today? A lot of people are going to go to hell. So I would say, give us time. Lord, so we can save more souls, so we can prepare our souls and not destroy the world today, you know, not come down and end this right now. You see, there is something mischievous about that, about looking for the end, when most people are not prepared. It's like most people are not ready to see the Lord. It's, I, and I'm sure that if each one of us really becomes sincere and looks deep inside, we probably find out we're not ready either. So I wouldn't like to die tonight, I tell you the truth. No. If the Lord takes me, yes, because He owns my life, and then He can take me any time. But if He were for me to choose, I'd say, I need more time. I need to really change a lot of stuff. I need to atone to a lot of things. I, I, I want to do more. I need to do more. So it's not like I'm saying, I'm ready to go, Lord. Well, I will never pretend that, ever. And I think none of us is ready. How could, how could we be ready? Not even the greatest saints were ready when they were dying, you know. St. Paul says, I, I end the, ra the race, the ra and, and I did this and did the other. But he teaches us how, how it is that he said, I wish I could be with God already. But if I think about it, I think I'd rather stay with you and try to save more souls than going where I want to go. And that's the way he's expressing himself about, about deciding to go with God right away or staying. And today, I, I think our sincerity has to go to, to understand that we need to save our souls and we need to save souls. And this is the only reason we are here. There's no other reason. 
If I am here with you today, and my main purpose is not to come here to make sure that we get closer to God and that I, that I came here because I love you and because I care for your salvation, then may God take me right away because I will be a useless human being that is only producing vanity. And I'm here just to present myself and to provide more gain for my attentions that I get from people. So this is a horrible sight. A lot of people do that. Say, so God forbid we do that. We have to be here because we are concerned, very concerned. That's the only reason we should be here. We are here because we are concerned about our salvation, because we are concerned about everyone's salvation, because we are concerned about knowing God better and getting deeper into God so that that way we can share God better, in a better way. Because the more we penetrate, we internate ourselves into God, the more we can share of God, because the more people can see God in us. See, God's mystery is impregnated in us the deeper we get into God. You notice how a couple that is married and love each other, how impregnated they are of each other. You almost, when they see them by themselves, you almost see the other in them. You know, it's like, if you see the husband, you see the wife in him. He's almost presenting his wife wherever he is. And the wife is presenting the husband because they are so together. You know, it's like, and this is what happens with us and God. A good marriage with God is God is, is seen in me because people can see I have a good marriage with God. So they can see God in me. And God will manifest by his wisdom, by his by firmness and kindness and love, compassion, but this great firm way of teaching where people are not going to have a chance. No chance. They have to do it now. It's now. It's like uh, I'm talking about a chance to, to hold back. No chance. You see, Jesus, the great teacher, he was always pushing the apostles. He was never letting them sleep and hang out there just, just in idle living. He was always pushing them to give more. Always. He would always say, watch out, lest you be put through the test. You know, don't don't lay back. Don't lay back on, on your laziness, on your, on your little humanity. Just go, go and give more. We need to always give more. And then how do we give? Giving is not only providing material things to people or providing people with our friendship. Giving is, is changing our hearts. That's the best giving we can do. The best giving I can do for you is to get to be holier every, every time. Because the holier I get, the more of God in me. And then the more of God in me, the more of God that you can see in me. And therefore, the more of God you can learn by seeing it in me. This is the greatest gift we can give to each other. Holiness. When we get holier, when we become holier, people know God better immediately. Because holiness is God. He is the holy one. So holiness is to bring God into your life in a way that God can be seen in you. That is holiness. Because the Spirit is in you, dwelling in you, the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God is not simply uh, someone that is really pious. And then someone that is really religious. Someone that is really emotional about the faith. The Spirit of God in us is a spirit of transformation. Absolute radical transformation. Changes that are absolutely visible. Changes that are, that are tangible. That one can see... This person was transformed by God and is shown in every act, in everything, in every step. Even the body language has changed. Even his eyes has changed, her eyes, her demeanor, everything has changed because he's been transformed completely. Otherwise, where is all this bread of life going to? Where is all this wine going to, this blood? This blood has to change you and transform you. And the more you take of it, the more you're responsible of that change. Because what good does it do if you're consuming this and, you, and nothing is happening in your life? So why are you using this? Why are you eating the bread of life if it is not giving you life? If, you, if you're not accepting the life you're eating. And that happens a lot. A lot of people are eating life and living death. And it's horrible because that hurts. And, and, and Jesus, uh, Jesus is sad because of that. Every time someone tastes that, that bread of life and is going to walk with death right after taking it. Now, when we see the reality of our faith today as far as the need, the incredible need we have
to, to present the Christ alive in our lives in a world that is godless, in a world that is hopeless, in a world that is so dark and so evil. And I don't think the world has ever been different because in the times of Christ, when you read what he was teaching, he was saying the world is in the hands of the prince of this world is Satan. So he was showing the world as something really dark. Because if, if, if Satan is the prince of this world, this world couldn't be too bright. And then St. John says, the whole world is in the hands of the devil. But you know, we have to understand this. What is the world? I don't know how many people ask this question. What is the world? What is world? Because a lot of people think world is earth, the earth. But it's not the earth. World is a spirit. It's the spirit of materialism. It's the spirit of temporary life. It's the spirit of mortality. It's the spirit of temporality. It's the spirit of greed. It's the spirit of ambitions that have no, no God in them. That is the world. It's a spirit. So that's why the spirit of the world is the spirit of evil. And it's called a spirit of nature. But the world, the, the earth, creation, God created good. Only that we can embrace the spirit of the world while we are on earth and then we can be trapped by the spirit of the earth the spirit of the world and drown on earth into the abyss of the darkness God is showing to us in the person of Jesus Christ our temporary life as, a, as an incredible opportunity as a seed that has to be buried but it will be transformed as any seed any seed has to be buried, planted, and then it will be transformed. Appear, appears to die, but it's not dying. It's transforming. So what we need to do is to understand that mystery so that we can make sure our seed, the seed that we are, is healthy. Because, you know, some seeds are not healthy, and when they are planted, they don't bloom. They, nothing comes out of them. So we have to understand that the responsibility we have in order to to feed and nourish the seed that we are is immense because they, no one else is going to do it for us. We are responsible for that. And what is that seed? How can you nourish your seed, this humanity of yours, this gift of life? The only way, the only way you can feed it is through love, the love of God. It's the only way. And how do you find that love of God? The love of God is not only the opportunity to come and, take, and, and have communion here every day or to pray or to live the faith in many ways, or to go and give alms to the poor. Is it, you see, the love of God is the understanding of the gift of life to begin with, and the understanding of our eternal sense of living, to understand we are immortal if we believe in Him and obey Him, and also to understand that salvation is for everyone. That salvation is for every one of us, the native in the jungle, the Buddhist, the Hindu, the Christian, the Muslim, the Jew, the atheist, salvation is for everyone. And we have to have that clear. Because if we have that clear, then we understand the love of God. The love of God is for everyone. The love of God is for all of humanity. And then our responsibility, in order for us to understand how to nourish ourselves with the love of God, is to love one another, for real. So, and never to select people. Always to be open to love everyone. And it is the only way you will ever meet God. There's no other way you could ever see God. If you don't do that, you're going to have to, if you save yourself at the end of this life, you've spent years in purgatory learning how to love because you didn't get it. See, it's like uh, today is the opportunity for us to expand our hearts and touch everyone by loving them. The, you see, the, the stranger, everyone. Because, and especially our enemies, people that don't like us, don't love us, don't accept us, despise us. Those people in particular, those are a capital, a gain. Jesus was teaching to us, saying, if we will pay attention to everything Jesus said, we have the truth. Because that is exactly what we need to do. And here, he says, love your enemies. And then one say, how could I ever love my enemies? You see, in the Italian law, um, the Mosaic law, they taught them to hate their enemies and take revenge. It was an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. That's, the, that's why Jews and, and Jews and Muslims will never have peace until Jesus returns. There's never going to be peace in the Middle East until the second coming. And why is that? 
because, because they don't forgive. See, they are under the Moses law. They are not redeemed. So therefore, if you do, as a Jew, you do something to a Muslim, the Muslim, by law, has to take revenge on you. So imagine how old the accounts are when they are constantly killing each other. They're never going to end. So how could they get peace? They, can, they never get peace until Jesus comes back, unless they convert into Christianity and learn how to forgive. It's the only way. So, so if we understand this mystery, then we know that all of us have this great responsibility of understanding that salvation is for everyone. And then if we get that, we begin to understand the mystery of life that is the school of love. See, the earth is the beginning for us. This is, this is, what, this is the place where God created us. And from here we go on into an eternal journey. We'll never end. Especially if we walk it with, with God. And now... If we get that clear and right, then we have to understand that there is a transformation at the end of this road, which is apparently we die. See, if we understand that we do not die, but we transform, then we begin to live an eternal sense of living. We, we begin to understand eternity. We begin to understand immortality. And then we will overcome mortality and temporality we overcome that, then we will be free from a lot of fears and anxieties. We will be free from time and space. We will be free from that. And, and this is the calling of the gospel. The gospel is to set us free. That's why in so many ways, all the epistles of St. Paul and the letters of the different apostles and the, and the gospels, they are all at the end, at the very end, they are all teaching us to understand immortality and to overcome mortality, but to walk like eternal beings. Eternal beings walk with faith and are not in a rush because they are eternal. So they are not running, not running anywhere. Your time is not running out. But what a disgrace to see a Christian afraid of time and thinking the time is running out. That is a disgrace. It's like a scandal. Where is the gospel? Why are you calling yourself a Christian when you are such a mortal, right? When you are just counting your days and watching your wrinkles, right? Because every time you get a new wrinkle, you're more scared. And, and so the time is for us to understand our immortality. And this is, this is something we have to aim for. We have to talk to God and say, Lord, I am a Christian. You gave me the greatest gift. I'm anointed with your spirit, but I'm not living up to that. Because I live like a mortal. Though you gave me an immortal anointing. You gave me a supernatural gift of eternal life. And I behave just like a temporary human being. I'm filled with fears. I'm so in love with this temporary life. I'm so attached to death. I'm so attached to every little thing that is going to come to pass. And I made of that my, my safety. When I'm clinging from something that is dying right in front of me. Life is passing by and everything that I grab seems to die. Everything that I grab don't seem to be there. Very soon it's gone. And, and I still cling from that when I know I'm clinging from death. And so all of the things had to be confronted face to face in order to shed all of that and to cling from the truth and to cling from immortality, from Christ, from life. And that, that way we will become what we are to become. Beacons of light, we will become columns of light. That's what God wants from us. See, the, the only way you could have light in you is if you have the Spirit in you, the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God you couldn't possibly have if you are just a simple mortal being that is afraid of very temporary events in your life. You, if you are a being that is completely conceiving immortality, all the light is on you and you are hope for everyone. You are hope. You will understand that though you know you are immortal, you understand the fragility and vulnerability of your temporary life. You will never forget that. You will be humble. It's like St. Paul, when he asked the Lord to take that thorn of his flesh, that was like a demon that Satan sent straight from hell to torment him. You know, he was very sincere in telling us. God told him he wasn't going to heal him from that. He said, my grace suffices you. I glorify myself in your weakness. See, what does it mean? It means that 
regardless of how immortal St. Paul knew that he was, he still had to live in this vessel of clay, in this temporary tent, as St. Peter calls it. And he knew his temporary tent, this, this temporary vessel was fragile, was vulnerable, and he had to live with that. Though he has this incredibly mortal soul in him that was gigantic and brave, he had to deal with this fragile, vulnerable piece of flesh. And that was terrible when, when you have so much spirit in you like St. Paul had, and then find this fragile body and say, heal this body, Lord. Heal, take this thorn of my flesh. And then the Lord says, oh, no, no. You have to keep it. Keep it that way. Keep it imperfect. Keep it miserable like it is. Because I don't want you to be the perfect apostle so you don't have compassion with anyone. See? Keep it humble. Keep it imperfect. So that's why our defects, our weaknesses, our misery is a capital if we know how to run it. If we know how to manage it. See, my misery should be a gain, as opposed to be a, mis a, a, a torment. A torment will heal if we understand that that torment is good. Because, you see, a lot of people avoid suffering. And you know, the most popular Christianity of today is the preaching of God saying, I want you free, I want you healed, I want you wealthy. I want you to succeed in everything you do in your life. I came here to save you and rescue and give you the greatest life. Hallelujah. Everyone, everyone wants to be there. They pack stadiums when they preach like that. But the calling of the gospel is very different. The Lord is calling us to understand our temporary life as something that is passing by. And it's something we don't have to cling from. And it's something that we don't have to demand to be perfect. We have to understand suffering as an opportunity. We have to understand trials and tribulations as a good test. It's like the Apostle St. James says, Blessed is he who endures trials with love and, 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 and patience. Because God will test you. Put you through the test, but because he loves you. And that's the way he molds us. You will never be molded if you don't understand the suffering and understand that suffering is good. It's not that we're going to look for suffering, but it's that we're going to embrace suffering when it comes along as an opportunity. Because all people, you know, most people on earth, what are they doing? They are looking to avoid suffering all the time. That's why people divorce so easy. That's why parents and children don't get along sometimes. Because they rather cut off their relationships than deal with the problems and the suffering that it provides to be real and to accept things just the way they are and to forgive each other. They rather just cut off from everyone. And everyone is looking for, for gain. Everyone is looking for comfort. Everyone is looking to avoid pain. That's why painkillers are the most popular pill over the counter, right? Everybody wants to buy them. No one wants pain. Not even for a second. And if we understood that that suffering, that pain, is the, is the source of greatest healing. You notice how when someone lives a spoiled life, a life that is so incredibly over, overprotected, and th those people like that are so weak, any little crisis will tear them apart. They have no way, they have no defenses, no, no spiritual immune system. They are completely depleted of all kinds of strength. Because they've been overprotected. So they don't know what suffering is about. Some people live in a bubble. And oh, do they have problems? Spiritual problems. Big spiritual problems. Because they don't know how to fight. They have no way to fight. They have been always protected, overprotected. So how are they going to confront the trials and troubles of this life? Whenever anything comes along, any little thing comes along, they want to kill it. They don't want any suffering. Because they don't understand it. Because they've been kept in a bubble. So, today, the Gospel speaks about, on Sunday, about forgiveness and about the revenges of God. And beautiful reflections about that. And, and, and when today the Lord presents us with a centurion, he's, he's telling us, salvation is for everyone. You see, he, it's probably me, because I forgot. I'm very sorry about that. You see, the centurion shows us something incredible. And it is Jesus saying, I haven't even found this kind of faith in Israel. So what is he saying? This pagan 
a Roman centurion had bigger faith than the Jews. And he gave him whatever he asked. He healed his slave and he really presented him as a great human being. And he glorified his faith. So the teachings in that passage are very important. Jesus is healing and, and, and doing it with everyone, not only with the Jews. Salvation is for everyone. And then now, somehow, when we are just plainly religious and not spiritual, we have an attitude with people that are non-Christians. We have a feeling that they are not, that they, they don't have it, that they are missing it, and that they are in great danger. And I tell you, great danger is sin. Great danger is not being out there without knowing Christ. That's not a great danger. Great danger is sin, sin, because God is going to judge us on love, not on religions. Us, we are in trouble if we don't understand the responsibilities we have as to what God entrusted us with, our religion that is His church, His army, His, the true religion. We are in trouble if we don't do what we, are, we were given. Those other people, the rest of the world, they don't have the responsibility that we have. God didn't give it to them. They, they're going to have to respond to their works, their actions in life. And God is going to put it on, a balance, on, a, on, on this scale. And then whatever happens there, the judgment is going to be based on their works in life. But we have beyond our works, we have our religion. That's something on top of everything. When a Hindu comes before God, God is not going to ask him for Hinduism. Because Hinduism is man-made. So God didn't give it to them, therefore they are not responsible for that. That's not, it doesn't mean anything before God. He's going to ask the Hindu, show me your works. And that's what he's going to be judged on. And anybody else that will show up with whatever they were doing and believing, they're not going to be judged on that. But us. We were given something that comes from God, our religion. So he's going to ask us for what he gave us and said, what about your religion? See, we're going to be asked that. So what is our religion and what are we doing with our religion? That is the big question because I see more and more how blind most people are about what they are holding, especially when you see them come to, go to communion. I, it's painful. It's horrible because, you know, there is no faith there. There is no acknowledgement of the true presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. There is no acknowledgement of the responsibility you have once you eat it and what is going to happen to you. You know that once we eat that bread, it radiates and feeds souls everywhere. But if our, if our heart is not prepared... Because we are not in grace with God and we take that breath, is that we eat our own condemnation, as St. Paul says, because we are not able to radiate that, that grace of God to others. So it fires back, it comes against us. You notice how in the Last Supper is the biggest example of what the Eucharist taking in mortal sin does. You know, in the Last Supper, Jesus consecrated that bread and that wine. And then to Judas, he put this little piece of bread in the wine, gave it to Judas in the mouth, and said, go and do your thing. And the scriptures say that Satan entered in Judas. So what does it mean? He took communion in mortal sin because he was going to betray the master. So he's going to walk out of there to do wrong. So that is to, that's what happens when we come here, take communion and walk out there to do wrong. That means we go against Jesus, that's Judas Iscariot. And what does, how does the spirit of Satan enter through the Eucharist when the Eucharist is Jesus himself? But what happens is that our heart is in such bad shape that Satan is running it. So once you take the Eucharist, you go out there to serve the devil, and therefore the Eucharist is turning against you. It's witnessing against you. And, and that's why it's so important to understand that the Eucharist is an incredible responsibility. It is the nourishment of all souls, of all humanity. When I take communion, I'm feeding all souls. 
The Lord is through me, using me as an instrument of nourishment of souls. And this is a fact, absolute fact. We are not taking communion just for us. We are taking communion for humanity. Have you ever asked yourself, I'm sure you have, you have asked yourself, what happened to all those people that will never take the Eucharist, will never eat this bread of life? What happened to those people that will never know Jesus and all of this? This is a big question. And the question, the answer is, salvation can only come through Jesus Christ. And then you say, how could they be saved if they never met Jesus? There is, there is the vision of eternity. What happens? It's not over. It's not over. It's not only about this time. It goes on. See, when someone dies, it's not over. So that soul comes out and is in front of Jesus immediately. By her or himself. Right there in front of Jesus. At the very moment of dying. Instantaneously. There. And then... That person that didn't know Jesus during his earthly life, had no clue of Jesus, never heard anything about commandments, nothing of God. But that person was born with the infused knowledge of good and evil, like every human being, and knew the conduct of good and evil. And that person lived according to the love that was in his heart or her heart. So instantaneously, when seeing Jesus, we we'll acknowledge Jesus as the Lord, because always gave the Lordship to love. So it will be rescued through love and will be entered salvation through Jesus because every single soul will be judged by Jesus. Therefore, salvation can only come through Jesus Christ. The thing is that people that have the interpretation of the Bible in a temporary state, like it happens to so many Christian denominations that have this horrible interpretation of the scriptures because they lost the grace. See, now what happened? They say salvation is through Jesus Christ now. Those that are not baptized before they die, they don't attain salvation. It's almost like what the Muslims say, they all, we all going to go to hell. They are, they are going to heaven, we are all condemned. Right? So Now, this is not the reality. The reality is that God created each human being for salvation, regardless. But he's going to judge us on, on love. So now, one thing very important for us is to understand that God has provided for us something very important and it is that we need to understand the responsibilities we have as far as how we deal with our faith on a daily basis see our faith has to be alive all the time 24 hours a day we are not to be faithful only when we are performing our religious moments see a lot of people are very close to God when they pray very close to God when they are in mass very close to God when they are in a pilgrimage or watching a religious movie or having a religious conversation and they are very close to God. The rest of the time when none of these activities are happening, those people are not with God. They, they are with themselves and the world and they don't have God in their hearts. So when we understand what God is asking from us, we have to understand that God is asking us to be 100% with Him all the time. We have to be with God. We have to do everything we do. We have to do it with God. Everything. And the answer is, Satan is 100% evil. He doesn't deal with 80 or 90% evil. He deals with 100. 100%. So how could we fight him? We can only fight him with 100% goodness. And 100% goodness is not possible for us to come up with. Because we are imperfect. So Jesus is completeness. Jesus comes to complete us what we are lacking. So the only way to fight it is a union with God that is absolutely radical. It has to be 100% with God. It cannot be 80%. You will never hear that the Catholic Church canonized a saint that was 72% holy, right? It had to have been 100%. So this is what we need to understand. I have to radically move towards the light, radically move towards the light. You see, this kind of preaching is not very popular today because people consider this so fundamental and so extreme that people say this is fanaticism because they don't deal with the gospel anymore the way it's written. They have accommodated the word of God conveniently to their own ways of living. So, 
But the truth will never be changed or accommodated to anyone. The truth is the truth. If we are not 100% with God, we belong to the devil. As simple as that. See, it's like some people say, he's kind of good. The answer to the gospel will be, he's not good. Because you couldn't be kind of good. There's no possibility. I mean, you think that someone will be sort of good? That means it's not good, right? See, if you are sort of good, that means you are not good. And if you are sort of bad, that means you are bad. So this is what we have to have clear. Because sometimes we get confused. We understand that we are sinners and imperfect. We know that. And we know we have to deal with that all the time. But the fact that we are sinners and we are imperfect, that doesn't mean that we live up to that imperfection and sin. We are completely despising sin and despising our imperfection and striving to be perfect and sinless. That should, that should be us. Regardless of how far I am into making it, if my goal is only that, I am walking on a path of holiness. Because God is not going to expect me to be perfect now and holy now, while I am dwelling within this imperfect body and, in, and dwelling in an imperfect creation. No, He's not going to demand that from, from us. But one thing He wants from us, that all we want is perfection and holiness. That's what He wants from us. It's like uh, I always give this example, especially lately. If you have a, a child that is studying really hard to make the great, and you see the child doing it so strongly, I mean, the dedication and the sacrifices, and then the day of the grade, the child will not pass the grade and come back, comes back home frustrated and sad. For that parent that is just and good, that child passed the grade. Though he didn't make it in school, but he made it in the heart of the, of the father or mother, the good parents, because they knew that child gave it all. Gave it all. So, so that is God with us. God is not watching if we make the grade and get the diploma. God is watching if all we want is to make the grade, and all we want is to really do it right. And that is what counts. So it's very important to have this clear, because we will know that we are imperfect and sinners. You see, some of the preachers today are very dangerous because they led you to believe that it is okay to be imperfect and, and sinful because God created us like that and He understands that we are like that. That's, that's the wrong preaching. The right preaching is we are imperfect and sinful, but all we want to strive for is for perfection and to be sinless. So this is a big difference. See, there's two different preachings because, yes, I acknowledge my sinful nature. I acknowledge my imperfection, but I despise it. I want to overcome it because God came and told me face to face through the person of Jesus Christ that I am to be perfect and holy as his father is perfect and holy. And he said, if you follow me, if you understand what I'm teaching you and what I'm telling you, you will make it to be holy and perfect. And this is not a lie, because God himself told us in the person of Jesus. So this is our only aim and our only goal, to understand that all we want is perfection and holiness. So every day we should walk up, wake up and, and desire only this. And that way we will live with God 24 hours a day. Because living with God 24 hours a day is not being on your knees praying rosaries. No. It's not being on your knees going to seven masses, masses a day. No, it's just being with God with the decision of being holy. So you will be holy in everything you do. And you will be holy everywhere you go. And you will be holy in everything you feel. You will be holy in everything you think. And you will be holy in everything you plan to do. And, and you will be holy with your past. You will be holy with your present. Everywhere you will be holy. How? By wanting holiness in everything you do. As simple as that. You're not going to make it to be perfect or holy before you die. No. But if that is all you want, that's all you're going to get at the end. But if you don't work in that direction, at the end of this life, God is going to teach you how to desire that in a very painful state that is called purgatory. If you could see the millions of souls that are doing just that in purgatory, just learning that lesson, you will rush into learning it now. Because it is the time to do it. 
right now. It is the time to understand we have to be 100% within God. 100%. We cannot deal with anything else. And it's a decision we take. We have to take that decision. That you will never, ever in your life will feel peace and joy like you will if you take a decision so serious to go on your knees and tell the Lord, all I want is to be holy. All I want is to be perfect. Have mercy on me. But that is the only thing I want from now on. Nothing else. I don't want anything else. Don't give me any fortunes. Don't give me, not even physical health. Don't give me anything. Give me holiness and perfection. That's all I want. And if you take a decision so serious like that, you're on. You are on for the first time in your life. Because if you don't take decisions like that, you're off. You're never on. How could you be on? It's like when you get married, you have to take the decision of being 100% faithful to your wife. Otherwise, will that marriage work? Will that marriage be real? It will never be real. So when you go to get married, you say 100% I love her. 100% I love him. I be forever, until I die, I be with my husband or my wife. And I love her and I'll be faithful to him or to her. And this is a decision for a good marriage. But this is the decision with God. You have to say, 100% I love you, Lord. 100% I'll be faithful to you. I just want to be loyal, faithful, 100% all the times of my life, every time in my life, all my life. And nothing else is going to provide a real faith in your heart. Nothing else will turn this religion into a spirituality. Because I tell you, you can do wonders about your religion. I know people, I can see in their eyes. They are so packed with information. They deal with all kinds of deep topics of the faith. And they manage a lot of prayers and a lot of stuff. And I can see they are off. They are off. Because they, are not, they haven't done the most important part. So they just pack with religion. No spirituality. Spirituality can only come along, only come along, when you decide to be a saint. It's the only time. Otherwise, you will never be spiritual. How could you be spiritual if you're not striving for holiness 100%? How could you ever be spiritual? When to be spiritual, it is to truly strive for holiness 100%. And I told you that people find this exaggerated. People find this overboard. Like, it's, it's just fanatical. I guarantee you, it is not. It is the truth. It is the absolute truth. Read the gospel carefully, and you're not going to find anything different. This is exactly how Jesus is talking. Jesus is only saying that. He's saying, either you are of me, or you're not. See? It's either yes, yes, or no, no. It's black and white. It's either you belong to me, or you belong to the devil. Choose. Choose. Don't look back. If you come along with me, don't look back. Just go on. Walk with me. And this is Christ. See, there is no other way of putting it. So that's why we are so confused today with all these modern theologies and all these strange people that are coming to change the truth of God and conquering people's intelligence. You see, intelligence is, is one of our greatest weakness. You know how these Jehovah Witnesses take people? They take them through intelligence because they have one angel that rules them. It's a fallen angel. And you probably imagine how intelligent that angel is. The angel that travels with the angels that rules the Jehovah Witnesses uh, uh, cult. Father Gabriel Amor, which is, you know, the exorcist, he said he spent more time trying to deprogram a Jehovah Witness than to exorcise a satanic priest from the northern uh, Italy, from northern Italy. See, he spent Years trying to get this guy back from the Jehovah Witnesses program because they take their minds. And he's an angel who takes your mind. He's so intelligent. They work through science, human science. And that's how they get you. And it's very hard to get you out of that maze. It's like a maze. And so intelligence is one of our greatest weaknesses. And you know why? Because of original sin. We ate a fruit we shouldn't eat. Therefore, we know what we shouldn't know. We know too much. And that's why God tells us, be small. Be little. You have to die to self. Because we know too much. And you know what the worst thing is? That we want to know more. 
That is our biggest disease. We want to know even more. That's why the scriptures say, human knowledge, human science is rubbish to God. Nothing. But with that, I'm not saying that God is saying that we should not, never um, uh, embrace the gifts of God. You know, human science is given to us by God. But when we worship human science and disregard God, then that means we are worshiping our own human intelligence and disregarding the source of intelligence. And that is the problem. That's why we have atheist people. That's why we have all these people that are so earthly and have no sense of spirituality. So I'm going to ask the Lord to give us his word because this reflection could never end because it is eternal. So I'm, I'm going to read to you from 1 Corinthians 15, 20. And it says, Christ gave us the way. But no, Christ has been raised from the dead and he comes before all those who have fallen asleep. A human being brought dead, a human being also brings resurrection of the dead. All die for being Adams, and in Christ all will receive life. However, each one in his own time. First Christ, then Christ's people when he comes. Then the end will come when Christ delivers the kingdom to God the Father after having destroyed every rule, authority, and power. For he must reign and put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed will be death. As the scripture says, God has subjected everything under his feet. When we say that everything is put under his feet, we exclude, of course, the Father who subjects everything to him. When the Father has subjected everything to him, the Son will place himself under the one who subjected everything to him. From then on, God will be all in all. So I praise the Lord for all of you, for this temple, for this parish, for the gifts of faith, for the opportunity God has given us tonight to sit here and reflect together upon the mysteries of the faith, and also for the opportunity to allow the Holy Spirit to touch deep in our hearts and to take us in this journey of really contemplating how deep is the love of God and how much we have to internate ourselves in that realm of eternal love. Amen.